Hi everyone, my name is David Mapang from the University of Twente in the Netherlands. First of all, I would like to thank the OFC organizer to allow me to um, present my tutorial in this format through uh, video conferencing in Zoom. Um, of course, uh, this is not by any means uh, an optimum way to do this, uh, but then I'm hoping that uh, still uh, with this uh, presentation, one can still um, get an update about what's going on in this in this field. And of course, I'm also would like to wish that everybody is healthy, um, staying safe, and then also enjoying the meeting in person there in San Diego. <coughs> so today. As uh, shown in the title, I'm going to talk about uh, the field of integrated microelectronics, but to be precise about the new opportunities in the field um, that is available because uh, a, a new wave of technologies become available um, for microelectronics. Um, I will start with the definition of microelectronics, of course, um, in a very relaxed way one can uh, define microphotonics as manipulation of RF signals using photonic techniques and components so that's quite broad manipulation can range from uh, transmission of signals uh, down to processing uh, generation but also uh, measurement of these kind of signals right <clears throat> and this has been uh, motivated in the beginning uh, through the realization that if one wants to communicate using uh, high frequency radio frequency signals or microwave signals and wants to transfer that through a long length of uh, coaxial cables, for example, uh, as the frequency goes higher and higher, the losses are getting uh, higher and ha higher as well. So, um, then people realized, on the other hand, uh, there's, uh, there was a rapid development for optical fibers as a transmission medium, and this offers, in principle, very low loss uh, transmission uh, with losses, for example, uh, of the order of 0.2 dB per kilometer. <clears throat> so uh, this motivates uh, people to try to the RF signals into the optical domain uh, and this gives birth to the uh, what is so called um, microwave photonic link so this is showing the canonical uh, topology of such a link where you have a stage where you can modulate your RF signal to the optical domain uh, optical fiber as a typical transmission medium uh, for these uh, signals and a photo detection stage at the end to retrieve back the RF signals. But then um, more and more uh, efforts were put into the, the, the processing that can be done in the optical domain because then once the signal is already in the optical domain, uh, it's not only transmission that can be enabled, but then there's also uh, a large array of functionalities that can be done in the optical domain, including filtering, delay lines, phase shifting, uh, frequency up and down conversion, um, and so on and so forth. So this, again, put it the, the field forward uh, by creating microphotonic system where processing is done instead of only transmission. <clears throat> Uh, and in the last 10 years or so, there's a, a lot of push towards uh, uh, integrating this microphotonic signal process or let's say um, more and more into photonic integrated circuit. <clears throat> and this is um, sensible because then at the end of the day, microphotonics is, a, is an RF in, RF out kind of system, just like an RF circuit. Uh, and then to be able to uh, complement the, the 
available circuits in traditional RF technology, microphotonics needs also to have a similar kind of a footprint compared to traditional RF, right? And RF is very integrated, a mature technology, so it's sensible to have more and more uh, or higher level of integration for microphotonics as well. And in the in the beginning of the field of integrated microphotonics, a lot of focus was given towards what sort of material platforms that can be used to have high level of integration of these functionalities. Uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of um, um, circuits proposed in uh, silica planar lightwave circuits. For example, gallium arsenide has been looked at, lithium niobate, it was in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, but as it progressed, the field was crystallized more towards uh, technologies that we know nowadays. Uh, three main technologies are silicon, indium phosphide and silicon nitride. <clears throat> there, of course, later on, I will also mention about different uh, the uh, let's say material platform that has been looked at. Uh, lithium niobate seems to have a comeback these days and also nonlinear glasses like charcoal and has been looked at for microphotonics. So apart from that um, uh, material platforms, a lot has been looked at uh, how to make basic uh, functionalities in RF, for example, can be carried out using these integrated circuits. A filter was uh, uh, one of the most important functionalities that have been looked at a lot. I will also be speaking about filters later on in my tutorial. Um, and this is an example of lattice uh, ring-based filters uh, proposed by the group uh, in UCSB. Uh, on the right here, we looked at the uh, spectral shaper waveform generator in silicon uh, proposed by the group in Purdue. And then below here is a circuit that can uh, do beam steering, RF beam steering or beam forming uh, using silicon nitride chip that we looked at here at the University of Trent. Uh, um, several years ago. So these are the basic functionalities <clears throat> that form the bulk of the work in microphotonics in the early years. But recently, uh, when one looked at the field, there are new uh, wave of technologies that was were not uh, available before for the field that now has been incorporated in microphotonics. This is just showing the snapshots of this technology. I will be talking uh, more in details about this. Uh, but then I think there are two main messages here is that because of this new uh, technologies become available, the field itself becomes uh, broader and bigger. So I would say uh, a lot of the functionalities are also bringing the field beyond the traditional uh, telecommunication based functionality that was initially uh, there in the beginning of integrated microphotonics. But then the second one that is also as important is that because the field gets bigger, there are more intersection with other growing fields in photonics, for example, quantum photonics, neuromorphic photonics, uh, optomechanics, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> So this kind of sharing of technologies also make the field richer, right? So um, if we take a look at these technologies, and this is what really what we wanted to do together with Professor Jan Ping Yao in Ottawa and Professor Rose Kapmani in uh, UPV, Valencia, uh, we would like to summarize it and then also give a bit of perspective of how this field would evolve in the coming years, right? And this is summarized in this review article in Nature Photonics that appeared uh, early last year. So this figure is taken from the, from the paper. Um, what are these new technologies? If we take a look at the sources, for example, uh, micro resonator based frequency combs nowadays have been uh, used 
in microphotonic systems. And these can be a game changing technology because then it provides really uh, well stable, well defined frequencies, multiple frequencies that can be uh, of low noise. And uh, this is very important for microwave signal generation, for example, or also for uh, multiple um, sources for multi-tap filtering, for example. <clears throat> On the side of the optical moderator, there are more and more advanced moderators in lithium niobate and also in silicon using plasmonic uh, structures, for example, that aims to have efficient modulation at high frequencies where it seems to be the direction of microwave photonics is also going to higher and higher frequencies. If you take a look at the, the kind of functionality um, that uh, can be chosen, for example, filtering, uh, nowadays there are higher resolution filters based on photon phonon coupling, so a coupling of acoustic waves, uh, so in the broader sense, optomechanics, to, to perform high resolution filtering for RF signals. And I will be talking precisely also about uh, stimulated pre wang scattering as ways to couple this photon and phonon on acoustic wave and optical waves. <clears throat> and there's also a paradigm of looking at the whole microwave photonic circuit to, uh, as a programmable, programmable processor. So this is inspired by electronics where you can make uh, kind of generic circuit is not um, application specific, but it's also um, reprogrammable and you use software to access different functionalities at the different parts of the chips. Uh, and this is also uh, uh, growing in the field of microphotonics. And many of these are uh, enabled by the fact that now through uh, integration techniques, we can make multi, multiple materials go together in, on, on our chip to do different functionalities. For example, uh, integration of 3.5 with silicon, lithium niobate with silicon, 3.5 silicon nitride, for example, and so on and so forth. So advancement in lithography in uh, integration techniques also push forward some of these functionalities. I will start with the frequency combs, so with the source. So many of us already know what a frequency comb is, um, but for the purpose of microwave photonics, it's, uh, it's interesting to look at the spectrum and then the fact that there are uh, uh, sources of multiple uh, oscillation at different wavelengths where the stability between these two, uh, uh, between the teeth of the frequency comb is very stable. Um, so one can use these for microphotonics in two ways. The first one is that if uh, you can select uh, different uh, comb lines and then send it to a photo detector. In principle, you can generate high frequency microwaves with uh, exceptional stability and uh, noise performance, uh, creating beat notes by beating different lines of the frequency comb. Uh, there, uh, I put the references down here that has been looked at by several groups, for example, by OE Waves, uh, EPFL group, and also uh, Pahala group in Caltech. Second way, uh, well, before going that, uh, of course, we also we are also interested in, uh, in 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 looking at these frequency combs. This is showing our first result of combs coming from silicon nitride chip, fabricated uh, in Linux International, which is a company 200 meters from uh, our offices. So we have good uh, collaborations with Lionix, and this is the, the first frequency comb coming out of uh, their silicon nitride platform, which in principle can also be integrated uh, further with the low loss waveguide technologies from Lionix. So as I mentioned before, the second way to use optical frequency comb for microphotonics is to use it as multiple wavelength sources, right? 
uh, and one way, one uh, application that uh, can benefit from that is uh, what is called the multi-tap filtering. In multi-tap filtering, you can imagine that you have multi-wavelength uh, from various lasers or from a frequency comb that is modulated by the, uh, the same RF signal. Uh, and then for each of these uh, wavelengths, uh, you want to shape the uh, phase and amplitude response and delay response of each of these lines, and then you want to interfere them at the photo detector. Um, what, what the result is that because of this RF interference of different lines carrying uh, the RF signal, you can open certain kind of pass band or stop bands depending on the setting of your amplitude, phase, and delay response that you put into your uh, optical signal. So this has been looked at a lot in in terms of fiber-based uh, filters, but then the, a lot of efforts nowadays to integrate the key components of these multi-tap filters. One being the multi-wavelength source, which is now a silicon nitride, well, can be silicon nitride, can be other technology as well, but then a micro resonator based frequency combs, um, and also other efforts to integrate other components uh, of the filter. For example, the pulse shaper can be integrated using indium phosphide based circuit. This has been looked at by uh, the group in Purdue, for example, or to integrate the delay line, dispersive delay line. Uh, into three five um, um, gallium indium phosphide uh, photonic crystal waveguides, for example. Uh, on the right here, I'm also putting this picture from uh, Marco Longcar's group in Harvard. Uh, and then the message here is that uh, uh, this kind of combs from lithium niobate, for example, can also be used and. I think it's very interesting to also integrate this with the optical modulator, for example, in the context of uh, multi-tap filtering. So uh, this is just showing uh, the, the setup of how you would uh, use this kind of micro, uh, micro ring based frequency comb as a multi-tap filter. This is again from the group uh, in Purdue and the wireless group in Purdue. So you pump the ring, it will give a rather broad frequency comb, uh, but then the advantage for microphotonics is that you don't need a lot of lines typically. Um, so not very broad frequency comb will, also, will already be useful for microphotonics. In this case, they achieve uh, a few lines that is being shaped by a pulse shaper uh, and then being sent to the photo, uh, to the modulator uh, delay lines, and then finally uh, uh, being interfered in a photo detector. And this is the kind of RF response that one can achieve. And then by changing the setting of the delay of the amplitude response and so on and so forth, using these two pulse shapers, for example, one can change the the the, the response of the filter. So um, that's the integration of the, the, the frequency comb itself. As I mentioned before, the delay line is also a fertile ground of looking at integration techniques to achieve that. Uh, switch delay lines have been looked at. A ring-based or resonator-based delay line has been looked at as well by various groups from Twente, and this is, I think, from McGill. Um, uh, but also what is very interesting is to use photonic crystal as a dispersive delay line and then you can have different delays by changing the central frequency of your uh, the central frequency of your laser line for example and this has been done by a collaboration from Thales uh, TRT in uh, France and also UPV uh, using 35 based uh, photonic crystal so uh, that is what's happening from the source point of view. Uh, another important uh, component in microphotonics is uh, optical modulators. And then the challenge here is to have efficient modulation 
also at high frequencies, right? And lithium niobate has always been the workhorse for uh, modulators in microelectronics, but then uh, recently the group in Harvard uh, sort of redefined um, lithium niobate modulators using uh, nanophotonic approaches. They they end up having modulator that is shorter, more efficient, and also lower loss. And this is the kind of performance that has been demonstrated. So for a 20 millimeter long modulator, you have uh, phi pi or switching voltage around 1.4 volt uh, with relatively low insertion loss. And this can be a game changer also for microphotonics because you can, you can imagine that all sort of losses, conversion losses in the modulator is actually the, the, the beginning of the uh, performance degradation in typical microphotonic systems, including a high noise figure, uh, and low linearity and so on and so forth. So this can be very important for microelectronics. On the other hand, uh, some groups are looking at how to achieve uh, efficient modulation at high frequencies, in this case uh, around 500 gigahertz, and you need a different kind of te technology for that. You need really short modulator, uh, really low capacitance, high bandwidth, and this can be achieved using uh, plasmonic modulators where optical field is uh, transformed uh, through uh, some sort of tapers to uh, uh, plasmonic modes, let's say, uh, where uh, in the slot of this plasmonic modulator, uh, modulator um, material, uh, focus effect, let's say, uh, has been deposited, and then you have very efficient modulator and low uh, capacitance such that you can uh, achieve high frequency uh, modulation. So these are new breed of modulators uh, that will uh, make a difference in the future of integrated microelectronics. Um, I mentioned about the shift of paradigm in terms of programmability for microelectronics. Um, this was uh, actually inspired by two fields, let's say. The first one, of course, in electronics, you have mature technologies and you have uh, uh, field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs, where you have circuits that can be activated for different kind of purposes through software. Uh, to some extent, that is also uh, available in uh, optics uh, through programmable optical signal processor, like, for example, the one that is commercially available here the wave shaper from Finisar, uh, LCOS based technology where you can uh, impart phase shift and amplitude response uh, for different spectral slice of your uh, information signal. To be able to achieve that in a photonic chip can be challenging, but then that is the way forward where you can imagine that one will fabricate a generic uh, design photonic chip where functionalities can be imparted only through software programming, right? So multiple, a single chip can do multiple functions or cascade of functions only through software uh, uh, reconfiguration. So uh, how to do that? Um, well, there are many publications or many resources have been proposing this and looking at this from the fundamental point of view, but also from the fabrication point of view. So this is quite a burgeoning field. Uh, one way to do it in the context of microphotonics is to use lattice of tunable element. In this case, the tunable element is chosen to be a uh, Massander uh, interferometer. Um, and this is uh, a result, this was a result from collaboration from our group here in Twente with the, the group of uh, Arthur Lowry in, um, in uh, Monash in Australia. But then the idea here is that if you arrange in lattice configuration this tunable unit, you can mimic different kind of uh, circuit uh, topology just by programming and then letting light go to different uh, paths, right? Um, they have demonstrated uh, various functionalities, for example, filtering from a 
add rock ring resonator or all pass ring resonator and cascade of resonators in this uh, in this paper. So the concept was taken to a different level by the group of Jose Capmani in uh, Valencia, where they optimized the kind of topology um, of this tunable unit. So instead of being arranged in a in a in a square lattice, they choose hexagonal mesh, and through calculation they can uh, uh, prove that this is the optimum way to have reduced area of the processor, but then still a high level of functionality. Experimentally, this was fabricated in silicon, and um, they demonstrated more than 20 functionalities using this silicon chip uh, with the applications beyond MWP uh, and also creating gates for integrated quantum photonics, for example. And this is also what I have been pointing out uh, in the beginning of my tutorial that because of sharing of this kind of technology and capability, microphotonics intersects with the uh, uh, other uh, growing field, in this case quantum photonics, for example, this is um, the kind of uh, chip uh, topology that was published by the group of Dirk England and Marin Soyacic and MIT, where they use it for uh, reconfigurable integrated quantum photonics, but also for neuromorphic photonics. And these applications share the same basic uh, requirements as microphotonics, uh, the configurability, large scale circuits, but also very low loss because then uh, uh, that determines how, scale, how, how large your uh, circuit can be and what sort of functionalities that you can do with that kind of scale. So um, I think uh, more and more parallel will be found between the integrated microphotonics and these two uh, growing fields. Okay, uh, I've touched upon uh, optomechanics in the beginning of my presentation, and really uh, the context of that is related to microphotonic filtering. So microphotonic filtering is one of the key functionality uh, that has been looked at a lot because then uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 front ends. Uh, topology that needs uh, filtering, tunable filtering, reconfigurable filtering with different frequencies and etc. So this is the topology of a microphotonic filter. Uh, you need to have a kind of modulator and then you use an optical filter in between and you, you try to down convert what you have in the optical filtering to the, uh, to the RF domain using uh, optical uh, detector or receiver, right? And it has a lot of merits, microphotonic uh, filters, because then it's so reconfigurable, uh, it has immunity to EMI, um, then, um, um, and yeah, reconfigurability is a big plus in this case. Um, but then there is, an, there is a problem that sometimes uh, is overlooked in the field, and this is uh, related to the, um, the signal density, the different signal density between RF and photonics. Let me explain this. So uh, the information that is being processed by a microphotonic filter is uh, of RF nature, meaning that the density of signal is typically uh, specific to RF information. And uh, this signal density is much higher compared to uh, optical signals because that signal separation, spectral separation in the RF domain can be uh, in, of the order of megahertz, right? Um, but then if we try to process this in the optical domain using optical filters, a lot of uh, the times we end up with not enough resolution because optical filters typically are uh, just developed for optical signal processing where uh, separation of signals can be of, uh, in, in the gigahertz. So there's uh, like three orders of magnitude, lower resolution, uh, that is what is needed to process RF signals. So ideally, you would like to have optical filters also with megahertz resolution. And this becomes a challenge because then uh, to do this 
in 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 a compact photonic chip, for example, uh, puts a lot of emphasis on how you manage the losses in your circuit, right? We would like to uh, look at um, what uh, can be done for this uh, spectral resolution, and uh, uh, some of them is summarized in this upcoming paper in Advances in Optics and Photonics (AOP). Um, where uh, we looked at uh, integrated microphotonic filters over the years, what has been uh, reported, and also a bit of uh, charting what is needed for the technology to be uh, relevant for uh, various applications, right? Uh, so this uh, paper will appear quite soon. Um, so before, uh, going into the kind of solutions in optical mechanics that uh, we want to uh, approach, uh, let let me clarify of what sort of uh, performance that is required for um, from a microphotonic filter or in general from a filter, right? So this uh, you typically have band pass filter or band stop filter, or sometimes people call it also a notch filter, where uh, what is important one is the insertion loss. So the insertion loss needs to be minimized because then you don't want to lose the signal that you want to process. Um, uh, apart from that is the 3dB bandwidth of this filter, the shape factor of, the, of this filter and also the rejection. So these are the key uh, components of a filter. But on top of that, you would also like to have a reconfiguration applied to this uh, filter, meaning that it will be ideal to have a single filter that can be tuned over a large central range of central frequencies, for example, or a filter that can be reconfigured from band pass to band stop, or uh, reconfigured in terms of the bandwidth and the shape of this filter. All of these are possible with microphotonics, but then there are several challenges that needs to be uh, addressed. And this is also would be uh, what I will be addressing in the remainder of my presentation. Okay, coming back to the spectral resolution. So one way to achieve high resolution filter is through photon and phonon interaction. Um, there are many flavors of photon and phonon interaction or acoustic wave, optical wave interaction. This is falling in a big uh, uh, um, area of uh, optomechanics, for example. But then the one that precisely I would like to discuss is the so-called stimulated Brewang scattering. So stimulated Brewang scattering is a, a light and sound interaction where the sound waves is generated through electrostriction. So um, in short, uh, let's say the, 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 the canonical backward stimulated periodic scattering happens when you have two optical waves uh, uh, going on an opposite direction inside the medium, let's say an optical fiber or an optical wave kind. So these optical waves will interfere. Um, if they are at the same frequencies, you will form a standing wave. So you have bright and dark spots, let's say along your uh, medium. Um, and uh, there are uh, two uh, implications here. The first is that because of gradient force, um, the transition between the, the, the bright and the dark spots induces forces. And this is through uh, electrostriction. It induces uh, compression through the material, right? That's first half of the stimulated scattering mechanism. The second one is that because there are compression that follows the interference pattern of this light, you have modification of reflective index, and this is called photoelasticity. Meaning that uh, the the the, the uh, region where it's being uh, compressed, for example, has higher reflective index, and the one that has reflection doesn't doesn't have the increase in the reflective index. So effectively, you are forming some sort of uh, optical grating along your medium. So 
uh, everything becomes uh, resonant and everything uh, uh, becomes more interesting, let's say, when you start to detune the, the frequencies of the two optical waves where you have uh, a pattern that is not uh, a standing wave anymore, but then also moves and they move with the speed of sound in the material. Using this kind of phase matching condition, what you will see is that there's a optimum energy transfer from the pump waves that is being back reflected, uh, but then with the frequency shift, so it's a Doppler effect uh, that adds energy to the to the what we call uh, the probe optical waves. So, uh, in short, what you see in the spectral domain is an amplification of the probe. Uh, but it happens only at a very specific frequency. So it's a very narrow band amplification. So it's a filter amplifier. Uh, and if you measure the width of this filter, uh, it's typically in the tens of megahertz. And this is dictated by the phonon lifetime or the lifetime of the acoustic wave uh, inside the material. And if you measure what is the frequency shift of this uh, amplification, filter response uh, it happens around 10 gigahertz which is also dictated by the the frequency of the acoustic wave so if you take a look at these uh, properties of the frequency shift and the width of uh, this uh, response one can immediately think about radio waves because then it's similar frequencies and then the density of the signal uh, in the radio uh, frequency, as we discussed before, needs this kind of spectral resolution. So what you get is a high spectral resolution optical filter uh, that can be a thousand times higher resolution than your typical ring resonator, silicon ring resonator, for example, and this is ideal for RF signal processing. So this slide is also uh, comparing the advantage of SPS based filter compared to ring resonators. As I mentioned before, we got the megahertz resolution almost for free because it's dictated by the phonon lifetime. On the other hand, if you want to achieve the same kind, similar kind of resolution, it can be done. So this has been reported by the, uh, the group in UCSB, then Blumenthal's group. Uh, you can make a really low loss silicon nitride based uh, ring resonator that has a uh, width of around six or seven megahertz but then these things are rather big right because then the bending radius uh, cannot be too small otherwise you lose your uh, light um, and that gives an impact of circuit uh, scaling capability because then if you have if you need only one ring that's fine but if you want to make more complicated filters you need to cascade the rings then this approach becomes a bit more difficult to upscale. SPS has another advantage is that the response is electrically uh, tailorable, meaning that let's say if you send one pump light, uh, you have this kind of Lorentzian response with a width of six or 10 megahertz. But then if you start to shape your pump light uh, as a frequency comb, for example, where you can tailor the spacing and you can tailor the, the amplitude response of this, uh, frequency comb, then you can shape your amplification and filtering response um, basically arbitrarily. And you can make the, 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 the filter uh, box shape, flat top, and also varying in bandwidth. So that's the advantage of looking at SPS. Uh, the challenge here is to <clears throat> efficiently uh, achieve photon and phonon coupling uh, not in long length of medium, so this has been looked at a lot in optical fibers, but then in short optical chip, right? Uh, in that case, uh, you need really to have them overlap in the same volume uh, and interact strongly. And in short, you need to build, one need to build uh, optical waveguide and acoustic waveguide using the same material platforms, uh, the same kind of waveguide, right? So we have achieved this in uh, uh, Sydney, the group of Ben Eggleton, through uh, a, a nonlinear uh, glass 
soft glass called uh, arsenic trisulfide, which is in the in the chalcogenide group, where uh, the the reflective index when you sandwich this between two uh, glass or silica uh, uh, material uh, will form a strong optical waveguide, so the index contrast is high, 2.45 uh, uh, against 1.5, let's say. So optical guiding is uh, achieved really well. But then the nice thing is that also the charcoal is quite a soft material, uh, so sound propagates uh, slower in this material compared to in glass. So that means that you, uh, through uh, this kind of imp impedance mismatch, let's say acoustic impedance mismatch, you can also have a phonon or, or acoustic wave guiding in the same volume as where your optical mode resides. So there is a strong interaction and by making the 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 the, the waveguide uh, have low propagation loss, one can achieve uh, SPS gains that is typically achieved in long length of optical fibers, you know, kilometers, only now that you achieve it in tens of centimeter waveguide. So immediately this kind of SPS uh, amplifier and filters can be integrated in a short optical chip. Of course, this has been also looked at at different uh, material platforms. For example, the group Peter Rackets has been looking at this in, in the context of silicon on insulator, where uh, phonon leakage from the silicon to the silicon oxide is mitigated through under etching, right? Uh, the group in Sydney looked at uh, uh, integration differently uh, in a sense that uh, let's say that one wants to build a silicon on insulator based photonic circuit that eventually can have a high end SPS uh, amplification. One can think of an SOI wafer or an uh, SOI, yeah, SOI wafer where oh, there's an opening edge in the, in the, in the silicon and the idea is that to activate locally through hybrid integration, uh, SPS amplification only in one part of the circuit. So it, this can be done by having this opening and then deposit uh, arsenic trisulfide, uh, lithography and etching such that one can make a, a waveguide or ring resonator uh, that is SPS active only in that part of the circuit and then the rest of the circuit can uh, um, perform other functionalities that complements the SPS. So this is just showing a photograph of the transition from the silicon to the uh, arsenic trisulfide layer. So um, this kind of photon phonon based uh, filtering has been uh, looked at to have high resolution filtering uh, this is, for example, a uh, notch filter with resolution tailorable from 30 to 80 megahertz. And this is a band pass filter. This is from a group of uh, Oscar Painter in Caltech, uh, where they looked at phononic crystal cavities, uh, where uh, a response due to the acoustic wave uh, transfer between this cavity uh, constitute a band pass filter with very narrow pass band, around 17 kilohertz, right? So again, uh, the incorporation of phonons and acoustic wave allows one to access this kind of regime of filtering that was not possible before. So a bit more about optical filter um, and microwave photonic filter. Uh, sometimes people just focus on what you can synthesize as an optical response example using ring resonator or SPS but then what is important is also that microphotonic filter can be tailored really well when you know how you're uh, tailoring your uh, modulated signal so this is just showing two examples of very simple uh, tailoring of the modulated signal where one synthesized rather than dual sideband modulation. This is a single sideband modulation. And when uh, the sideband is being processed by these optical responses or optical filtering, you have one-to-one -one relation 
between what you get in the optical domain and what you get in the RF domain. So for one-to-one -one mapping, a single sideband is the best way to do that, right? But sometimes you don't want to have one-to-one -one mapping because you want to enhance the performance of your filter, a microphotonic filter, as compared to your optical filter. And then the point here is that once you can tailor optical modulation spectrum in terms of the phase and amplitude relations of the optical carrier and the RF sidebands, you have access of a wealth of capabilities of enhancing the performance of your microphotonic filters. So optical modulation will determine the type of filtering that you can do, the rejection of your filter, the insertion loss of a filter, and eventually the noise figure of your filter. So it's very important to be able to control the phase and amplitude relation between uh, these modulated uh, components. So instead of being stuck with only a phase modulator response or intensity modulator response, one might want to, uh, to synthesize a filter which has asymmetric uh, sideband amplitudes and arbitrary uh, phase and amplitude. Uh, uh, sorry, phase relation between the carrier and the side beds. So, uh, an example again, if for example, if you want to make a notch filter uh, using a single side bed modulation, you will get the the filter response in the optical domain really mapped to a to the RF domain, and that is the simplest way to do that. Uh, but then. A different way to do it is to uh, shape your response not as a single sideband, but as I mentioned before, this kind of asymmetric uh, uh, sidebands with different amplitudes, well designed difference in the amplitude, um, but also a well designed phase relation between the sidebands. In this case, we would like to make a notch filter, so we want to have pi phase shift between these two sidebands or to be precise, the mixing product of the side pen and the optical carrier. So now that if you pass this into an optical filter, uh, there is not a notch filter, but then a bandpass filter, for example, SPS gain, what would happen? So if the SPS gain now is used to amplify only at a very specific frequency, uh, the, the weaker side pen, and then we send this shade spectrum into the photo detector, two things will happen. The first one is that outside the SPS gain regime, uh, you have two amplitudes that are not equal, but then they are of opposite phase for each frequency, and you will have cancellation. But then the cancellation is not complete. Inside the resonance, in, in the center of the resonance, you have exactly equal amplitude because then you shade the spectrum to match the amplification of the SPS gate, for example, uh, and exactly the opposite phase, meaning that at that frequency, when you mix it in the in the photo detector, you have you will have no signal because then there is complete disruptive interference. So you are creating uh, stop bands not by blocking the signal, but then by controlling RF interference at that precise frequency. So uh, this has been implemented using SPS. And then the advantage is that now you are increasing this filter rejection without uh, the need of pumping the SPS really strong. Uh, and the impact is that now you have low power chip based SPS filter, notch filter, that has high rejection, high res spectral resolution because it's a phonon based, phonon based filter, for example, but then also still the advantage of tailoring this uh, modulation, uh, sorry, uh, center of frequency over tens of gigahertz. So we also uh, try to extend this concept uh, by tailoring the modulation, not in the modulator, so to keep the modulator really simple, intensity modulator based uh, system, but then try to use the unique phase and amplitude response of ring resonators to have this kind of equalizing amplitude and pi phase inversion. So if you take a ring resonator and you control the coupling to from the bus waveguide to the ring resonator, you can control it in the undercoupling or overcoupling regime, depending on the, the 
coupling coefficient and the losses in the resonator in the um, undercoupling regime um, uh, and the overcoupling regime if one compares the magnitude response there is a difference but then it's not that stark difference so you can control it such that they have the same rejection for example in this case it's around 5 dB but then the phase is very different in the the phase response of an undercoupled ring is centered around a zero uh, phase change, let's say, and then uh, and then the the, the the phase change is small compared to uh, the overcoupling regime. The overcoupling regime, you have a phase inversion that goes from zero to two pi, let's say, and then in the middle you have pi phase inversion. So if you now send two uh, intensity modulated side bands going to two ring resonator. One is processed with the overcoupling and the other with the undercoupling. You send this to a photo detector. At the center of resonance, they will uh, completely cancel. So you open again a high rejection filter, but now with a simple modulator. What is the impact? A simple intensity modulator, one can uh, achieve uh, low, uh, sorry, noise figure enhancement through low biasing. So the idea here is that the chip, the resonator will take care of this pi phase inversion and then you can freely use your intensity modulator to do low biasing. So the aim here is to have an all optimized filter where the center, the, the pass band is strong, the rejection is high, the resolution is high, but then also noise figure is improved because then low biasing typically leads to noise figure reduction. So this is the kind of results that we've been uh, demonstrating. So over a 12 gigahertz range, you have a filter that has gain in the past band uh, that has relatively low noise figure of around 15 dB and then uh, also a high spurious free dynamic range. Uh, and now you can start to do filtering uh, where you have uh, um, low power desired signal compared to a high or strong interferer. You put that into your filter and what you get is that the signal has amplification, so you have 2 dB gain, but then the, the interference is being rejected almost by 50 dB. So this is the kind of filter, if you go back to the picture that I present before, uh, an idealized filter will have a strong passband, high rejection, high resolution, uh, and then also high, no uh, well, low noise figure uh, in the passband. And this is something that we want to push uh, using this kind of uh, results. So the final notes in the two uh, slides that I have is the integration. So you have SPS-based filter, you have ring-based processing. Right now, they are separate. Uh, it's important to be able to combine them because then each have their own merit. And this is the first step where uh, this is from the group of Ben, uh, ben Eggleton in Sydney, uh, where they built an arsenic trisulfide uh, or chacogenide circuit where you interface a ring resonator with SPS waveguide. And then the idea is that uh, you have both the phase inversion based on ring resonator and also the high resolution based on uh, SPS waveguide, and this is the kind of filtering response that they can demonstrate. Um, but of course, there's still a mismatch between the resolution of the SPS and the ring resonator, and this can be improved by having lower loss in the resonator. Here in Twente, we also would like to have higher level of integration where you have uh, integrated pre one processor, where you can interface detector, uh, tunable ring resonators, optical frequency comb source, and modulator, and the SPS medium inside a single chip, let's say. This is already the kind of integration that we can do together with Lionix. So this doesn't involve SPS, but then this is a beamformer chip where you have laser, uh, detector, and modulator, integrated hybridly with a low loss silicon nitride based reconfigurable circuit. And then we can also build the RF and then uh, the, the DC electronics to drive the system. And then the idea is to have an extension of this kind of uh, tight integration into Briwang based signal processor. So I would like to summarize my talk 
I've talked about uh, te new technology tools that are available for integrated microelectronics. This makes the field bigger, more uh, functionalities, and also more intersection with different kind of uh, burgeoning fields in optics. Uh, and then new concept of programmability or using optomechanics to do high resolution filtering or frequency combs and etc. It's just making the field richer. And then the next step, of course, is to have this kind of different technologies to be integrated in a, 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 a tightly integrated hybrid uh, circuits or monolithic, uh, depending on the capabilities of the integration. So uh, this is just showing uh, the, the group that uh, we have here in Twente. I would like to thank you for your attention. I would also to like to thank the funding bodies that fund our research. I think the final message is that um, stay safe, uh, stay healthy there in San Diego. I would have liked to discuss further with you. If you have queries, you can send me an email. Uh, but then I hope that this presentation gives a perspective about what is happening right now in the field of integrated microelectronics. Thank you very much.